Welcome in, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. It is the first one of the first week of the season, and I can't tell you how excited I am that we will finally have college basketball to watch this week. We will have games to talk about this week. I will be bringing up some of those games and a little bit of what we are going to see. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you're on YouTube. Uh, and be sure to like the podcast on your favorite streaming service. And then also, uh, quick follow on all of the all of the social medias at Post by Zach. And then also the new X account um, at Unoff WCC Pod. That is the official uh account for the podcast so go ahead over to twitter and give a follow there as well and as we went into this week again like i'll i'll get into some of the game previews of this week a lot happening a lot of really good games this first week of wcc play um i'll also go into like a game to watch and a player to watch uh, this week as well but i want to start with the uh, one of the exhibitions we got to see over the weekend, and that was Gonzaga against Lewis and Clark. Uh, that was on Friday night. Uh, you were, able, I was able to watch a little bit of it. Didn't get to watch the whole thing uh, between those two, and I think it was a good early indicator of reminding everybody of how deep Gonzaga is and how talented some of the guys that they brought in were. Um, and first and foremost, this was a, this was a reminder of not only how good Ryan Nemhard is, but also how good Graham EK is. Uh, first with Nemhard, I mean, he had 10 assists on the night. He didn't shoot all that well, but it was highlighted what he meant, what the difference was having him around for the Zags. And, I've said it time and time again in the off season, and we finally got to see a little bit of it on Friday is the difference that a true point guard makes the difference of someone who's going to push the tempo, run the offense, do it efficiently, how much of a difference that person makes. And that Gonzaga offense moves so much more quickly, looks so much more in sync with him running the point. And yes, always taking these games with a grain of salt, especially considering it was against Lewis and Clark. But it was very clear just how just the difference that he made, how already in sync with the offense he is, how he understands that system already. And obviously, like he had a little bit of insider knowledge with uh, his uh, older brother, Andrew, having already gone through Gonzaga. But again, this was a very good early sign of seeing how he could really push tempo and find the open guys and everybody got involved again, 10 assists on the night. So good early signs with Nemhart. Anything where we kind of knew what we were going to see. I don't think that was any real big surprise. Mm -hmm. And this next one isn't a surprise, but I did feel like it, it was a good sign. And that was the performance of Graham EK. He came out and did, I think what at, at his best, what we all thought he could do. He had 24 points, he, incredibly efficient, 11 for 13 from the floor. Uh, but he was moving really well. And I think that was more important than anything. He looked healthy. He was running the floor. He had a really nice touch around the basket, not only uh, cutting to the basket, but also his back to the basket game was there as well. So a lot, a lot of positive things to come out of that performance. Really it was nice to see EK be healthy and if he is and if he remains healthy and gets better and is the guy that everybody thinks he's going to be this is a player of the year candidate this is one of the better big men in the country uh and as and we'll see as we go along that Graham EK uh looked the part the other night again against lower competition but as we get into uh real games here soon we'll see uh, which Graham E.K. we see going into uh, the rest of the non-conference and then further into the season. Nolan Hickman had, had a nice game. So did Ben Gregg. There were a lot of guys who had some uh, really nice performances. Uh, but the one I think that stuck out the most, as we talked about the depth of this team, kind of one through six, we knew what they had, but what were they going to get from seven, eight, nine, ten? And we may have gotten an early 
glimpse of what that could look like. And that came from Braden Huff. Uh, he had 21 points. He was eight for 11 from the floor. He was able to do it from everywhere. He had a really nice touch around the basket. Uh, he was crashing the boards. He, he was maybe the biggest uh, wow moment for me uh, in that game and seeing how much he's developed, how much he's improved. Uh, the broadcast uh, talked a little bit about how uh, uh, Drew Timmy would say that he was like the, the toughest red shirt he's ever had to go against. And, and I think we kind of see why it's like, he's going to be, he's, it looks like he's turning into one of that, one of those next great Gonzaga bigs. Uh, we knew he had the talent there. It was just a matter of whether he was going to get the opportunity. Could he develop quick enough? And 21 points off the bench the other night uh, is a very good sign, incredibly good sign, uh, even if it does come against uh, Lewis and Clark. I, that it's a, it's a bright sign for Gonzaga, especially when depth has been one of the uh, question marks for this team. All right, so... With that, we'll start talking about the games that are going to count, the games that will actually stick on everybody's record, and that starts Monday night, and we have a slew of games that are going to be coming in um, on this Monday night. A lot, a lot to actually look at, a lot to be excited about. Uh, this, uh, Gonza this, so as you can see, if those who actually can see my um, who are watching the video feed um, can see the full schedule of games that we have coming up uh, this Monday. Uh, we have six games going on um, all at once. We have Pacific is going to be taking on Sam Houston, uh, Pepperdine, uh, Concordia, Irvine, Port uh, St. Mary's with Stanislaus State, San Diego, Sonoma State, USF has Bethesda, a lot of D2 opponents in that grouping. But the game I want to highlight, the game I think is going to be the one to watch uh, this this opening night is going to be Long Beach State and Portland. This is a Long Beach State team that is picked to finish second in the Big West. This is a team that is going to really challenge Portland. And honestly, like this is this is going to be a big test for the pilots. Uh, this this is also a very experienced Long Beach team. Uh, this and they're going to have some familiar familiar names, not necessarily faces, uh, to come up against uh, the two big ones, uh, both on the All Big West preseason team, uh, Abakar Traore and uh, Lasina Traore. Both both of them are going to be loads uh, for, for Portland to deal with. Uh, Abakar at, at last year averaged 10.8 points, 8.8 rebounds. Uh, he's also going to be able to run the floor and actually run that offense a little bit. Three and a half assists last year, 55% from the floor. Uh, Lasina Trori, 13.9, uh, 10 and a half rebounds a game, uh, the 6'10 center. This, so again, that's a lot of rebounds from two guys. Uh, by the way, not related. Um, and these, and one of the things that Portland struggled with a year ago and has struggled with is size. And, really kind of clearing the glass and being able to do that. Portland last year was ninth in the league in rebounding margin. So the boards are going to be a huge, a huge uh, factor in this game, especially with Long Beach State doing that part so well with two guys. They return five of their six starters. So a lot of the offense is still going to be back from a Long Beach team that did finish seventh last year, but they were banged up a year ago. So there's hope that this, that this Long Beach team is going to be a little bit is going to be better than a year ago. And obviously the coaches also think that having picked them second in that league, one of the, so guards is also going to be one of the things that Long Beach has to work out. That's something that is probably going to be a little bit of a work in progress. But one of the guys who's going to be part of that is uh, Messiah Thompson. He's transferred from Alabama A&M. Uh, he's going to be, he he's a career 37% three point shooter last year. He was 40%. Uh, so this is a guy who's going to be able to give them some, be able to stretch the floor a little bit for this uh, long beach team. And, and that's all. And that's another key for Portland because kind of like the rebounding margin, they were ninth in the, in the WCC in opponents, three point percentage defending the perimeter and, and taking care of the glass are the two keys for Portland in this one. Two keys that we've kind of known this is one of the pro these are the problems for Portland. 
we'll see how quickly they've been able to to remedy those. Uh, we know some of the pieces that are going to be there for Portland. Uh, we know that Tyler Robertson is going to be back, and we know that he can fill up a stat sheet. But really, it's where else are they going to get it? Where else is Portland going to get that help, um, not only on perimeter def- defense, but also just from uh, from the front line? Are we going to see something from Yudo Yamanuchi? Are we going to see something from Alamani Karma? So these are guys that they're going to need to really be a factor early on. Uh, they're probably going to need some, uh, Thomas Osterbrock to be also be a factor in this one. Uh, so again, Portland we know has a lot of new faces. They have a lot of pieces that were that are hoping to fit together, uh, and this will be a good early test for Portland. Uh, I think it's going to be a challenge. This Long Beach team is good, um, and if I, I mean, if I'm picking one or the other, and I'm probably going to take Long Beach in that one. But if Portland can pull this one out, and they are hosting up at the Child Center, uh, that's going to be a really good sign uh, for this. Uh, for this um, Portland team. All right. And so the schedule gets a little bit light as we go through, is a little bit light midweek, but then as we get into the weekend, it's going to get stronger and stronger for the WCC. And I'm going to start off with what is probably the best game of the weekend. And that is Thursday night when New Mexico goes to Moraga to take on St. Mary's. Uh, this New Mexico team is good. You have to remember, like this was a this was a team that started ten and zero last year. This was a team that really start hit its stride early a year ago, and two of the reasons why are is this amazing backcourt of uh, Jalen House and Jamal Mashburn Jr. Uh, they were there a year ago. They both return, and they really tore St. Mary's up a year ago. This was. Uh, House had 17 points on 5 and 11 from the floor. He had six steals. Uh, Mashburn with 12. He didn't have, play as well in that contest, uh, but they came out with a win at St. Mary's. Uh, that was St. That was catching St. Mary's in the middle of a three-game losing streak. Uh, they had just come off a loss to Washington, then lost to New Mexico, and then it was Houston. And that's and. You you have you're probably going to know like that St. Mary's team is remembers what happened in Moraga a year ago knows that they did not play well uh, knows that they didn't shoot from the free throw well in that game a year ago they were uh, was it seven I just had the number here where did I put it uh, seventeen for twenty seven from the free throw line in that contest they lost this game by four so this I think this is going to be one of the better games of the non conference this New Mexico team was picked to finish third in the Mountain West behind Boise and San Diego State. And and also, like that's not the only piece that you have to kind of watch for with this New Mexico team. Yes, I talked about House. I talked about Mashburn, who I thought, who I thought were both incredible last year. Uh, but also, one of the guys from in that backcourt coming off the bench is going to be Donovan Dent. And while overall for this season, he uh, struggled with his shot, he did not struggle against St. Mary's. Uh, he had in that contest he had uh, 13 points, 6 rebounds. For the year he was he was shooting 50% from the field with two and a half assists. This this is a young guy who's going to just get better and better and so the backcourt, the backcourt defense of St. Mary's is critical in this contest. And this was a team last year who had Logan Johnson on this team and and did did not have the number of bodies it may have needed to really defend this team. Uh, remember, St. Mary's has been a top 20 defense each of the last few years. And this New Mexico team was one of the better offenses a year ago, over 80 a game. Um, and in that contest, and against St. Mary's, they shot 49% from the field. Uh, this That was the seventh highest total against the Gales a year ago. Uh, three of the others were Gonzaga, UConn. You can kind of guess who the uh, who some of those better offensive teams were against St. Mary's. So this there's a lot there's going to be a lot to actually look at with this New Mexico team again. The backcourt I think about so it's going to be imperative on Augustus Marshallonis. It's going to be imperative on Aiden Mahaney. It's going to you're probably going to need a little bit more. Uh, from the bench as well on that front. So I think you're going to see a lot of pieces, especially on the backcourt, and two are going to have to pl- play key roles defensively 
against this New Mexico team to get the job done. Now, I do think there's an opportunity where one of the spaces uh, that they're, we're going to see one of the great, the bigger battles, one of maybe the better matchups is going to be on the front line. That's going to be uh, Mitchell Saxon against the uh, the new New Mexico center, I- Iona transfer Nelly Jr. Joseph. Uh, he he comes in um, from Iona, the other Gales on on the East Coast, uh, 6'10", 240. He was the MAC player of the year, 14 points, 10 rebounds. Uh, this is, I think, going to be a really good matchup between uh, those two, who both are pro- who both are probably going to be vying for all conference honors in both of their leagues. And this is a replacement of uh, Morris Udezi, who was their big man a year ago, the New Mexico big man a year ago. He had 13 and five uh, against St. Mary's. So, a lot of this is just going to be a fun, fun matchup. I'm my. My goal is to be there on Thursday night, so we'll see how that goes. But this is this is just going to be fun. This is going to be a great early test for St. Mary's. This is also going to be a great early test for New Mexico. It was a feather in the cap for New Mexico that almost got them in the NCAA tournament because they had beaten St. Mary's. And now I think we're not to say looking at this on the flip side, but there is a little bit of redemption on the St. Mary's side. There's a little bit of of na- of because this is earlier on, maybe they're going to be sharper. Maybe they're going to be more on top of their game. They, I don't think they were playing anywhere near their best when they saw New Mexico last year. It really felt like they kind of slept, walked into that game and nearly won that game anyway. So with a more focused St. Mary's team, I do think this is a game where St. Mary's will pull out a close one. But this but this guard set, this New Mexico team is going to give this team a run. And with St. Mary's maybe being a little bit more on the offensively focused side this year than they have been in years past, I could see this game getting into the high 70s or into the 80s uh, for both teams. I think this is just going to be a really, really fun game uh, to see between New Mexico and St. Mary's. Thursday night, um, on if, if we're not getting there in person, on ESPN+. Plus. All right, so next I'm going to go over one team that is playing two WCC opponents, and I think they're going to be both fascinating matchups, and that's Yale. Yale plays Gonzaga on Friday night, which will be Gonzaga's season opener in, in Spokane, and then they will head down, then Yale heads down to LA to take on LMU on Sunday. And a lot of a lot of publications are really high on this Yale team. Uh, they they won the Ivy outright in the regular season a year ago. They did not make the NCAA tournament because they did not win the Ivy League tournament. Uh, they were a first round exit in the NIT. But this this Yale team was twenty one and nine a year ago and returned seventy five percent of its minutes and seventy five percent of its scoring from a year ago, and. So this is going to be a very experienced, a very hungry Yale team. I expect them to give both. I think this is going to be a great test for Gonzaga in game one because this isn't, I you hear an Ivy League team and you might not necessarily give them the credence that they deserve. Yale deserves every every little bit of attention they are getting. They are um, in the preseason Ken Palm, they are 71. So this is a top hundred team that will be walking into the kennel on Friday night uh, there. And they have a number of, a number of really f- interesting pieces. One of the guys that it's going to be, who's going to be key is going to be Matt Noling, uh, 13 points, 13.6 points a game last year, 60% from inside the arc. One of the interesting uh, nuggets that I was able to find uh, via uh, the Almanac was uh, he shot 55 per- 55.6% from the field between four and 10 feet. And while that number may not sound amazing in and of itself, the context matters. That 55.6% between four and 10 feet is 14.7% higher than the national average. So he finishes well around the basket. He finishes well in short in short range. That's going to be key, as, especially as they have some of the better shooters in the Ivy League as well. Uh, August Mahoney, the 6'4 guard, uh, averaged 10.9 points last year. 
but he was shooting 46% from three. So this is this is someone you can't lose on on the offense on the defensive end for Gonzaga or LMU. You have to find the L, the I the 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 Ivy League shooters. You have to find the Yale shooters on this team. John Polokitis is another one, 6'6 guard. He was also a 40% three-point shooter last year, averaged 12 a game. And they're going to throw a lot of players at you. They had six players returning who averaged 11 minutes or more. They had a lot of guys who were playing at least eight minutes a game. So you're going to see a lot of different guys be thrown at you from this uh, Yale team. And maybe the most important one that I think is going to be a fascinating watch is going to be uh, Bez Mbeng, who was the Ivy League Defensive Player of the Year a year ago. But he also started to emerge offensively. He shot 44% from three in Ivy League play. This was a guy who's going now can bring it on the offensive end as well as the defensive end. And he's likely going to get matched up with Ryan Nemhart on Friday night. And I think this is going to be a really, really fun matchup to see uh, Nemhart against another guy who's going to be physical, who's going to give give him, I think, more fits than he might see early on in the in the non-conference. So for this to be night one, for this to be the team that Gonzaga sees early, don't be surprised if if Yale hangs around. Don't be surprised if in the fourth quarter, this is go- this is still a fight. This is still something that Yale could win. And I've already saw a few other people say like this feels like a four thirteen matchup. It absolutely will feel like a four thirteen matchup. I do, I do expect Gonzaga to pull that one out, uh, but I, this is going to be closer than I think a lot of people on surface level might think. This Yale team is good. They're going to challenge Gonzaga. And that's, it's going to be a fun matchup on Friday night in the opener for them. On Sunday with LMU, the one thing that Yale lost in the offseason was their centers, their, their two centers, who combined average 18.7 points, nine rebounds, 2.3 blocks. They lost one of the biggest strengths that they had a year ago, which was their interior presence. And this is where LMU is strongest at especially early on with Kelly Lau Pepe, with Rick Asanza, with Michael Graham, with Lars Theisman. They're they are loaded down low with experience. They are physical and this this might be a matchup that LMU can take advantage of and really attack. Especially as LMU is still trying to figure out their guard rotations, as they're trying to figure out who's going to be those guys who step up early. LMU can take advantage of the post. LMU can take advantage of that space. So it's. I think it's going to be. A, this is going to be a really good matchup for LMU in their first week of play. I think this. I think this is a matchup that LMU can win. I think they should win. Still win this. Uh, this is also still going to be a fight. I think LMU is going. I think. Sorry, not LMU. I think Yale is going to give Gonzaga a hell of a fight. I think they're going to give LMU a hell of a fight. I do think, and I am. I am optimistic that the WCC teams will come out 2-0 and against Yale after the weekend, uh, but it will not surprise me more surprising if it happens to Gonzaga but it would not surprise me if Yale does come out with a win um, over the weekend against one of those two teams So lastly on the list I have which is probably my, my game of the week because of the importance of this game and that would be USF traveling to Boise to take on Boise State. This is the most important game of the week, which is because USF needs to take advantage of every big opportunity it gets. And this is a big opportunity for the Dons. This Boise State team has been in the NCAA tournament each of the last couple of years. This is a Boise State team that is expected they probably expect to be back in the NCAA tournament. Uh, they were picked to finish second in the Mountain West. Uh, they they have a number of players still coming back from teams that were in the tournament. This was a team that was a top 30 defense each of the last couple of years. This Boise State team is good, and you're walking into their building in the first week of the season, and 
you're going to have to bring your A game right away against this team. Uh, uh, Tyson Denick Hart is one of the guys coming back for Boise State. He was an uh, all-Mountain West uh, preseason pick. 6'8 guy who was playing out of position a year ago. He was playing a lot more center. Uh, With some of the transfers they've brought in, he's going to be able to be on the perimeter a lot more, uh, which is going to obviously help help benefit him. He was a 14-point-per-game scorer a year ago, 5.3 rebounds. Uh, so something that they're that USF has to key in on. And one of the other guys you really have to watch is going to be Max Rice. Uh, this is Leon Rice's son, the head coach's son. Uh, 6'5 guard, 14 points per game, 4.6 rebounds. He was a 40% three-point shooter as well. Uh, and this this is a this is a pretty well balanced team. While they haven't been as offensively focused, they have some lethal offensive weapons that you have to make sure that you contend with. And Max Rice is one of them. He dropped twenty five against uh, Texas A and M. He had twenty six in one of the contests against San Diego State. This is this is going to be a tough matchup for USF. Um, the point guard play I think is going to be key. Marcus. Um, Stover uh, Staver is gone. He was one of the keys for Boise State. Um, and where is that going to come for USF? Is it going? Is it? Are we going to see more of that? Be Marcus Williams early on? Are we going to see um, Mike Sharavjams really step into that that role immediately and take over? Uh, and then all, and that's that's going to be the challenge for USF. How quickly can they turn this thing over? How quickly can this get they get this thing rolling? Because Boise is going to be ready because there's some level of continuity returning. They're going to be on their home court. They're going to be revved up for the first week of the season. Can USF go on the road, put it all together, and be ready for a team that fully expects to be back in the dance, fully expects to be right in the mix again? This might be where we where we have to see guys like Josh Coonan, Isaiah Hawthorne be a little bit more uh, assertive in that we're going to have to see, I think Jonathan Mogbo, uh, be that defensive guy right away for, for the Dons. I think we're going to need to s- see some of the offensive burst from someone like, uh, Robbie Beasley a little bit early on. So I, th- I think it's a challenge. I do think that this is probably an opportunity where USF is going to drop this one. I, I think this is going to be a good game. I do think that they're going to challenge Boise. I I think that at this time, in this moment, it might be a little bit of an uphill climb for USF as they're still trying to put pieces back together um, and build build into this year. But I do think that this game is game of the week because, again, USF's opportunities are more limited than some of the others um, in the WCC. This they do open with Boise. They will have Grand Canyon, who's also a sleeper pick. They do have Arizona State, Vandy, Utah State, Fresno State. But this is the this is going to me. This set this is a tone setter. If USF can get a win at Boise, it really changes the narrative right away of what USF could end up being. Because as I've point as I've said, I think USF might have the best shot of of the of the non St. Mary's Gonzaga teams to make the NCAA tournament. And this Boise State game is one of the reasons why. US have brought in a ton of talent. Now it's time to prove it. And and that kind of leads me into who is my player to watch this week. And I'm going with Mongolian Mike. It's Mike Sharov Johns. There's been a lot of hype around what he's go- what he's capable of doing, that he can run the point. He's a six eight guy who has all the talent in the world, top hundred guy, just didn't get as much opportunity at Dayton. And now he's gonna get that shot. Now he's going to we're gonna be able to see what he can do, and he's gonna be tested really early on with some high level competition in Boise State. They do have Bethesda on Monday night, but that's that they should run away with that one pretty easily. It's the game against Boise that's going to be a huge, huge um, eye-opening thing, I think, for not only this USF team, but also for um, for Shrav Johnson. Just seeing where he is in his progression, where he is in his development. Obviously, like it's, I'm not saying that it's this is the make or break game, because it's not. It's game two of the season. It does, in the grand scheme of things, there's a long way to go. 
And, but if he comes out the gate sharp, if he comes out the gate and looks like the guy that many believe that he can be in game one, in, in, in game two, it's going to say so much about what this team is going to be capable of moving forward throughout the rest of the non-conference and then into conference play. All right. With that, I'm going to close it out. This is an exciting week. It's the first week of the college basketball season. Uh, there are a few other previews. If you haven't checked them out, go back to the YouTube channel. Go back to the uh, go back to the um, the library of other podcasts. Go check out the previews of each of your individual teams. Also, check out on YouTube the the live we did last week with Rocco Miller, Connor Hope, and Andy Patton. That was a great conversation with three other WCC experts and really can kind of get a sense of what everyone's looking at. What's, what should you expect going into WCC play? There's a ton of storylines that we can kind of dive into. It's going to be fun throughout the course of this year. We have, depending on when you're watching this, some of the games have already started, uh, but this is come, uh, this is coming out on Sunday night, Monday morning. So get ready. College basketball season is here. I'm excited. I know you're excited. Uh, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and and follow along the rest of the season. And um, And then until next week, have a great one, and I will catch you later.